welcome to a new Harry's Garage video. And this one I thought I'd do a sort of roundup of what went on in 2019, what it's cost to run this fleet of cars. Um, I have a crib sheet from my insurance schedule um, and it runs to 94 pages, which is a bit scary. And it tells me that I, there are 20 cars on the policy and 16 motorbikes, which is a few up from last year, I think. And I'm also going to just look forward to what we're going to do in 2020 because there's some plans uh, for trips and some things to do with the cars. As you might imagine, I'm insured with Footman James and it's quite a policy because it covers everyone in the family and all the cars and all the bikes and also Harry's Garage so I can sort of go out and drive things and be insured driving things. And the policy costs £8,117 for 2019-2020. Uh, and it's quite a lot, it's gone up a bit. It's actually, I find it's the Project 7 and the Project 8, the two Jaguar special editions are the most expensive cars to insure on the policy. It seems modern cars cost way more to insure than the few hundred you pay, say, for the Countach, even though the value of the Countach is probably twice what the Jaguars are, but that's sort of how it works with classic cars. You're never gonna use that as your daily run around. And I think the Jaguars being specialists, etc., and very quick cars are quite insure, uh, expensive to insure. But I don't regret paying the insurance because you, uh, last time I did the roundup, the Mercedes 350 SL got 1971 um, Mercedes and we had a fire under the bonnet. And wow, it was an expensive repair. So the SL shop did the work on the car. And the basic thing with the fire damage, it was all around the engine. It was a petrol hose that had burst. And then the flames went around the engine and then underneath the car. And in the end, it was um, quite, quite a lot of the wiring loom had to be replaced. And this being a 1971 Mercedes SL, a sort of rare one because it had a four-speed automatic gearbox that then turned into a three-speed and they changed the injection system um, in 1972. So it's a sort of rare model, the very first launch edition of this R107. So parts weren't that easy. Um, it needed new fuel injectors, etc. And the total bill was £17,800. I mean, I only paid, I think, 9000 for this car, so I'm really grateful of Chubb uh, for continuing with the repair. I should say, of that total bill, um, I paid 2157 for some parts. Um, the steer, the, I basically, when, I, when it had the fire, I was about to take it in for a service and have the steering uh, box looked at. So they did that work as well, which obviously wasn't part of the insurance, but yeah. We now have a very fresh, very shiny Mercedes, and I think this color really suits it, and it's great to have back in the garage. Fortunately, there were some cars that we didn't spend anything on. Now, three cars I didn't spend a bean on in 2019 are here, the three Jaguars. Um, the XJ Coupe manual uh, V12, well, that went its historic road tax this year, which I was all very excited about. Actually, I ought to say 12 of the cars and bikes in here are now historic status. And I think that's a really good thing. It means you don't worry about taxing and MOT, etc. And I think going forward with this sort of electrification, I can see the historic um, tax will be a separate group when we get other emissions or rules, etc. But that's for another, another video. But XJ Coupe, stormed down to Goodwood in it, did a few other things. I would say it's a lie, I didn't spend any money on it because it still likes to have a, it drink super unleaded like 12, 14 MPG, but it makes a glorious noise, me, uh, well it does so, and it's a sort of firm favorite with the family. I'm not keen on the color. I would quite like to do the color, uh, change the color of it, but I can't quite infuse myself to do the full restoration. There's probably 20, 25,000 to spend on the car. I think I just enjoy it more, looking as it is, hasn't cost me anything, goes like stink. Um, in 2020, I'd quite like to change the speedo because it says you're doing 120 miles an hour when you're actually doing 70, so I ought to get that fixed. But yeah, that's that. Project 7 and the Project 8. Well, the Project 7 is a big favorite absolutely stay in this garage forever it just covers so many bases but we don't use it enough so we're um, planning some things 
come this year, there's some places I want to do, show you some um, special roads and that sort of thing. And the reason we haven't actually spent a bean on it, it's due a service, but I'm just waiting until 2020, until we actually start using it. So I'm not really using it in the winter. And the same goes for the Project 8. Um, I was using this an awful lot and I was watching the mileage go, it was about 9,000 miles by July, and I'm meant to be doing 6,000 miles a year in this. So I've sort of parked it up for this winter. Um, I'll probably um, get it back on the road sometime in Jan Feb time because I've got the winter tyres for it. And I've just got a, one or two things to do with that car as well. I can't decide whether to start hill climbing again um, because I can see that would be mighty competitive in the standard road going class. Um, we ran it up Prescott just on a friend, friends and family day, t-shirts, some beside me, and he just pressed the stopwatch on the dash and it was two seconds under my best time ever at Prescott after 20 years of trying. That sort of opened my eyes to the abilities of this car. I can't say I actually want to get into that scene again or not, but I've got a few other things that we'll do with the car in 2020, which I'm not going to reveal now. And the final one we didn't spend any money on this year was the Countach, which surprised me really. Um, I had a, a trip lined up in September with Lamborghini Polo Storico running an event out in Italy in September. And I had hoped at the beginning of the year to be attending that one. And then various things on the farm, um, dragged on, drilling, etc. And I couldn't actually go this year. So I was a bit gutted, but that was meant to be its big trip in 2019. Um, so it, it's been on a um, borrowed for sort of exhibition and that sort of thing. Um, but 2019 was a remarkably quiet year for the Kuntash. Having owned it for, well, it's knocking the door of 10 years, 2020. Um, there's a celebration, 50 years of Kuntash coming in 21, which was going to be a big year for it. 2020, I don't know if it's going to have another quiet year or not, but um, it's just one of those cars that when you open the door, what a car to look at. Um, you don't always have to drive it. It's great to hear, uh, but it's just visually, it's such a treat to see this car in the garage. So I don't really mind when it has a quiet year, because I still get to look at it. Right, now there are some cars that cost a bit more. So let's go and have a look at where, where the money went this year. Well, the Tesserossa had a proper busy time in 2018 because it was on the Grand Tour. They were lapping it and we did all that work. It was the most expensive car in the garage, I seem to remember the last report. So I was looking forward to really using this car in 2019. But the first thing I had to do was to change the brakes on it. Um, it had real juddery front brakes. They are absolutely cooked. Um, so I put new discs and pads on the front. And come last March, April, I thought, here we go. Started it up and it was coughing and spluttering and uh, it, it went to six cylinder uh, Testarossa which is not a lot of good and if you look at the engine, actually if you just follow me in here is actually two flat sixes, you have six cylinders that side and the six cylinders that side and everything is repeated, it has two ECUs, it has two distributors etc, two um, fuel injectors. So we did a whole load of diagnosis, what was going on? We basically discovered there was no sparks on this side and in the end all it needed was the rotor arm in this distributor had decided to pack up in there. Um, it took about £150 worth of investigation uh, and in all, with the brakes, I spent about um, £700 on this car. But, God, the transformation from that rotor arm, I can't tell you how much better this car ran. So it must have been sort of on the way out and giving a weak spark, still firing on 12, but not all the power. Now, it's proper healthy. We've all enjoyed this car. It's been on uh, exhibition, I think, at Hampton Court. We did that concourse thing. But actually, I've been driving this car quite a lot because it's so usable. Um, next to the Countach, if, if what car were going to sort of test the two cars together, the Testarossa would always win. It's just a friendly um, device. It, its visibility is great. The brakes works great. But it makes the most sensational sound. So, yeah, 2019, this car had a really good year. And I suspect 2020 will be equally good. Let's go and have a look at another one. Now, the Lotus Elan Sprint, the car I've owned forever. Well, 1993, I bought this car. Um, and it was going to have a big year in 2019 because Lotus had invited me along to the launch of their new electric hypercar down in London. 
and I've always had a niggle, and not always, the last couple of years of this car, I just couldn't get the wheels balanced. And it, you get up to sort of motorway speeds, and you have this constant vibration at the wheel. I had one more go knowing I was going to be driving into London, and finally, the tyre fitter down at Abbey Tires down in uh, Whitney spotted that they were slightly distorted, the tyres on this. They couldn't balance them up because they were getting old. They were like 10 years old, uh, performance testing things at Evo, and that was why I had this wheel wobble. On to Dougal at Longstone Tyres, 800 pounds later, and a new set of boots on this car, the Michelin 155 tyres. They're quite specialist tyres because you need the speed rating and it's 13 inch rims and you need 120 plus mile an hour for this car. Oh, hallelujah, transformed. Suddenly I don't have wheel wobble. It did the London trip, piece of cake. We took it down to Goodwood, I think, the revival meeting we went down to it. And suddenly I'm using this car way more. In fact, I've decided to winterize it. It's the, one of the cars, there's two, we'll get onto another one in a moment, that I'm using through the winter months as well. There's too many cars and bikes in here that I just don't use when it's salty roads, etc. But the fiberglass body and underpinnings has a um, spider chassis, which I'd like to get a Lotus uh, galvanized, so if it does rust a bit, never mind. But I spray it with ACF um, 60, this special fluid that does seem to stop corrosion in its tracks and uh, this thing is completely soaked in it and I'm driving around and enjoying it all months of the year. So um, Lotus Alan are going to have a big 2020. We've got also some trips with this one as well. So after the Lotus Alan, the next biggest spend was actually the Series 1. The Land Rover Series 1, the motorised wheelbarrow used around the farm. Suddenly noticed the brakes were going off. And then I had one moment coming outside the house, tried to stop, and all I could hear was skidding gravel. I was down to one working brake on the back. I thought, I better get this sorted. So I had all the brakes rebuilt on the Series 1, and that bill came to £1,348. But it's very good suddenly discovering you've got four wheel braking again after just having one wheel. Then the next spend was £1,597 on our Range Rover. Um, that one needed a new rear wiper. I have it serviced every year. That was about £600. Uh, and the car actually has a warranty on it. And I couldn't believe that they paid out on a, uh, an alternator fitted. It's done 115,000 miles, I think. And they didn't say well, fair wear and tear, etc. Paid out it was about £500 to replace £600. So that's the warranty cost back. Uh, so I was really surprised on that. So Range Rover, easy year, really. After that one, we get to the Rolls-Royce. Now, 2019, I had the Rolls-Royce shadow looked at after its Arctic trip. We sort of ran around with it after, but it had that choke issue. Power Spark Ignition sent me that kit to fit to it to get rid of the points. Oh my goodness, that made a huge difference. It starts just on the key instantly. Um, I can't get over the difference. I've actually got a, a, a PowerSpark kit for the Fiat 500 as well. Uh, it's dead easy to do, it just fits in the distributor. But there was a lot of other work we did. Did a full engine service, and we also had a look at the braking system because there's a funny pump on top of the engine, etc. And in all, we spent 1,820 pounds on the Rolls Royce this year. And I don't know what to do next with it. I'd be, we floated around with the four up, we'd go on pubs, etc., cetera, uh, trips, local really. But I did do a uh, run into London recently and it was just ace on that trip. But it does still burn a bit of oil. So I'm having a sort of moral, trying to do the man maths, whether they do work on it. It's about a 3,000 pound bill if I wanted to look at the rings or do something with the engine. But I ought to do something with the body as well. It's a little bit scabby around the size. And it's one of those cases, well, if I was going to rebuild a Rolls Royce, I probably wouldn't start here. But it is the Arctic Rolls, so I'm in a bit of a dilemma. We'll see what 2020 holds up. One car I'm very happy to spend money on, though, is the next one, the Lotus Esprit Turbo. Right, I'm getting more and more of a fan of this car the longer it stays around. Two years into owning it, had it serviced at the beginning of the year, been doing a few things. I had the uh, Evora out, I had this out at the same time. What gets me about this car is it sort of feels luxurious, but it's so light on its feet and it just 
the turbo on it, the sounds, the pops, the whistles, and the go, and the smoothness of the engine is highly addictive. Um, so much so that this is the other car I've winterized. It's, it's, why not drive this one through the winter as well? Galvanized chassis, um, glass fiber um, body, sprayed it, etc. treated it as well as I can. And I've even gone to the extent, if you come and have a look at this, we put new tires on this car and the giveaway is their name, Snow Prox. These are uh, winter tires on this car because I've got a trip coming up in a few weeks time uh, where we're going to have some fun with this car, maybe somewhere a bit snowy. Just before going there, the only thing I could spot possibly wrong with this car was a bit of rust on the radiator mounted in its nose so I had, took it up to Paul Matty and he changed the radiator on it well we had it recalled etc so it was about 1500 pounds so all in all with the tires I spent about 2200 on this car but worth every penny can't wait for 2020 and the things we're going to do with this car well, the big thing for the Alpha Duetto in 2019 was its trip around the Millimedia when we did that video, how to do the Millimedia without them actually taking part. But there was that death rattle I heard just before we were going to go. And I'm extremely grateful to Ian Ellis, Alpha, who rebuilt the engine in double quick time. I then quickly put a, a thousand miles on it. If you want to come across. So the full rebuild on, the, on this engine, complete with new pistons, liners, new bearings, etc. 5,600 pounds, which just shows you how good value these Alpha engines are. Parts availability is great, very simple engines to work on. Now, that all brings just general maintenance in the garage up to date, it's just on 16,000 pounds. But there's a biggie that we started in August that's going to push that bill right up. And that's the Lamborghini Espada. Now that's not here, but hopefully you've been following it on YouTube. And lots of you are asking, well, what's the final bill going to be on the Espada? I don't exactly know, but we did, before we started work, obviously we discussed the price of the rebuild. And it comes to, it's 200 pounds of labor to actually rebuild and refit the engine. 75 pounds an hour up uh, in tools. So there's 15,000 pounds worth in labor. I go through the bills from then. Bearing sets, 2,200 pounds. Um, gasket sets, 944 pounds. Timing chains, 470 pounds. Pistons, 12 pistons. A lot more expensive than doing this little alpha. Uh, 2,000 pounds for the pistons. Machining, generally machining, you've got to skim heads, um, bleed blast, etc. £2,500. Oh, the crank as well, polishing and balancing the crank. Plating, blasting, etc. £1,000. Radiator, we, I had the radiator rebuilt on that engine as well, £430 and other £1,000. Add that little lot up, £25,566 plus VAT, so £30,000 ballpark. Now, that's a big bill for anyone. Um, what I actually did, I decided to take out a, a, a magnitude finance loan um, as equity release, basically, because to me, the Espada, I bought it at 40,000 or thereabouts. If it's got a fully rebuilt engine, etc., it's worth 50,000 pounds more than it is now. So I don't mind sort of taking out a loan on it and then repaying it because I've got a car that's more valuable at the end of it. So that's what I did on the Espada. I did it for a little bit more than that, hoping there's a bit left so we can do some other things. So we're doing the um, roof, etc., on the Espada. But there's one other car I want to do in 2020. Let's go and have a look at that now. This is the first of the additions in 2019, my Lancia Fulvia Sport 1600, the Zegato version. And uh, I'm so excited to own this car. It needs a lot of work. And this is my dilemma with this car. How do I restore it? What do I do with it? Well, that's going to be a story of 2020. We're going to see how far we go with this Sparta. If there's any pennies left, we'll do something with this car. You know the backstory, please watch the video I did on this car and you sort of get to see why this car is so important to me. But it's just a delight, it's another really lightweight and just fun to drive. It's like an oversized Mini or something like that. Much more comfortable than I expected. And it was that one in, one out policy. It was the Mercedes SL600. I sold that at CCA auctions along with a Alancia Kappa, which I had to buy both to get this car. So that released 13,000 pounds. 
that paid quite a lot towards this car. So um, I paid in the 20s for this car, but it needs, it needs work. It needs 20 odd thousand spending on it or something. So that's something in 2020. That's it with the cars. But when you get to the motorbikes, three bikes joined us this year. A very peculiar um, Yamaha TT600 that has raced all over the place. It's the most peculiar looking bike I've ever seen. It actually rides extremely well. It has race suspension on it, but looks a dog's dinner. But it was £1,500. Then there was a Honda XL600 LM. Now, that was the bike I took over into Spain. It has a twin headlight. Look at it. Um, and I, it, was, it performed really well on that test, but that was actually something I want to do in 2020, something called Sand Raiders, and I wanted the electric start, lightweight, single-cylinder bike. That was my weapon of choice, so we're just going to get that prepared. That's in April of this year. And then a few weeks ago, a monster of a bike arrived in the garage, my Kawasaki Z1300. This is a six-cylinder bike, madness, from the 70s. I have that Kawasaki H2 triple two-stroke. That's 1974. Honda came out with their six-cylinder CBX air-cooled, stunning-looking bike. I almost bought one of those, but they're starting to get pretty expensive now. They're 15 to 20,000 for a good one. And the Kawasaki was one-upmanship gone mad. It was 1300 cc to the Honda's 1000 cc and 120 or 130 horsepower, depending if you had an injected one or not, against the 105 horsepower of the Honda. The Kawasaki Z1300 then made a European regulators say, we have to have a horsepower limit on motorbikes of 100 horsepower. So they put a restrictor on the Z1300 and six cylinder motorbikes basically fizzled out. There was Benelli as well um, at the time. They went back to four cylinder. Now they're doing six cylinders and they're way past the 100 horsepower as we all know. But I just wanted one of these monster bikes in the garage. It's just a bit of a childhood thing. Uh, when I saw it came out, I couldn't believe it. Now riding it, it's really quite a fun bike to use. And it's also historic again because it's September 79 built that bike. So it goes historic in 2020. So there you go. That's what's been going on in the garage. Quite a lot of activity. I try not to spend too much money this year, but I still managed to do over 50,000 because of the Sparda, but I know that's money well spent. Looking forward to 2020. Thanks so much for the support in 2019 as well. I've seen view figures go up about 50% in 2019 over 2018. And I'm trying to get more regular on the uh, videos as well. So I really appreciate all you subscribers. I think there's another 60,000 joining us in 2019. If you're not subscribed, well, please, tick on the button and the notification and all that sort of thing because there'll be lots of videos coming along in the new year thanks for watching